All right, well, we're back, uh, back here with Mike and Zach and Travis and Joel. Uh, we've had a little bit of time off, but fortunately, we are all okay and back to it. Um, in our Days of Vengeance, the Covenant lawsuit study that we're doing here, and uh, we were we were exchanging notes and talking about this, guys. And um, Mike has done a lot of work here in Revelation one three, and we don't want, we don't want to go too far until we really start getting into that. Mike and Joel both have. So, Mike, if you don't care, why don't we just take it off? I'm going to read the verse and then let you go from there. Does that sound good? Perfect. All right. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Yes, the time is at hand, or the time is near. And what so many commentators even partial preterists fly by on this passage is the Greek word for time here is kairos. It's not chronos. It's not a chronological time. It's kairos, which means it's a very specific eschatological period of time that would reach its consummation and climax or its head. And so it's super, super important. And it actually starts in Moses' eschatology in Deuteronomy 32 and in the Septuagint of verse 35 let me just get there uh look at point number six in Israel's last days when the appointed time kairos of consummation would come in a particular perverse and crooked generation Israel's end would be near but it wouldn't be near until the kairos the appointed time came and then Daniel picks this up in chapter 7, chapter 9, and chapter 12. Now, you got to remember that Daniel chapter 2 to chapter 7 is written in Aramaic, okay? So I was looking at Daniel 9 and, da and Daniel 12 when I saw Kairos in the Septuagint. I was like, man, all these parallels. I wonder why, you know, Daniel doesn't use it in chapter 7. Well, he does um, in verse 22 when the appointed time would come for the saints to inherit the kingdom, that's when the son of man would come upon the clouds, verse 13. Uh, but it's an Aramaic. So it's, it's the Aramaic equivalent to Kairos in Greek. And so, you know, I'm not going to go through all of the parallels between the song of Moses and all these other passages and Daniel and Isaiah and Jesus and Peter and John, but I just want to show you, give you a, a flow of how Kairos has first started in Deuteronomy 32. When a perverse generation comes, Israel's end would be near, but it wouldn't be near until the appointed time would come. That is when God would come in vengeance, all right, to avenge and to repay those that had killed his martyrs. And then the Gentiles would come in and they would rejoice over this judgment they would see. So it's really important that when John starts off and he says the appointed time is near, any good Jew, oh, the appointed time of Moses, the appointed time of Daniel, the appointed time of Isaiah, the appointed time, and, and Joel will talk about this, of Joel as well. So it's a, it's a loaded term. And uh, let me get to Isaiah. Let me do Isaiah real quick, and then I'm going to turn it over um, for Joel to do Joel. Again, you have all these parallels. I'm not going to go through them all. Just want to get to this one. Number 14. When the eschatological appointed time of consummation, that is Kairos in the Septuagint, it's used two times in Isaiah. Chapter 49, verse 8, and in chapter 60, verse 22, again in the Septuagint. When the appointed time would come, Isaiah says God is going to save Israel, the remnant. He's going to gather them. He's going to redeem them. And he's going to, uh, and then he's going to judge their oppressors, the blood of sin, guilt, right? Mm -hmm. And then in chapter 60, verse 22, he says, when the appointed time comes, it's going to be fulfilled shortly. And that's when I'm going to bring the remnant into the new Jerusalem where there's this perpetual light. Of course, that fits in perfectly with Revelation, right? Once we get into Revelation 21, 22, 
In chapter 22, when he says, yeah, this is the appointed time is near, again, he uses Kairos. So Isaiah is picking up on Deuteronomy 32. Daniel is picking up on the Kairos of Deuteronomy 32. And Joel, what have you seen in, uh, in Joel? Well, first of all, it's important for everyone to know I'm jumping in at the appointed time. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, I, I just appreciated, um, you know, Mikey sending out some things ahead of time that I had a chance to go over too. And um, I just, before I get straight into um, Joel, I just have a warning for, for the rest of you guys. And of course, I missed the last um, the last video, but we talked about this a little bit initially. But I, I, I'm just thinking for me to, you know, we have all the we have all the time all the time statements that seem really clear in Revelation, but it's occurring to me the more and more I study this that that it's it's more than that. It's this uh, some people call it the second Exodus period. Mm -hmm. um, but what was you know was there a moment when you realized this this is a very special and unique time in biblical history that that cannot that that's the way I understand it it's not repeatable. And what what the church is trying to do now we're trying to repeat. And live as that generation that no other generation can live as. And I'm just just curious because I do want to dive right into Joel. But any any thoughts on that before I do that? I said that this morning in Sunday school class that the climax of this thing was pointing you to the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Everything in First Peter one, what they were looking for, that knowledge was being revealed to them in the first century. Everything leads you to there. But there's a misunderstanding to what the Bible is trying to do. And if you think the Bible's trying to get you to a not, if you think that the heavenly city is some different uncovenant related, you know, oriented different planet, then you don't understand the purpose of what the Bible's trying to get you at. But when you do understand that it's trying to get you to the new Jerusalem, to the spiritual heavenly city, and that's what I, that's what Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Daniel, all of them saw and what they long for, then all of that makes more sense as to why so many things were happening during the time of the New Testament, which leads you to, you know, back to Kairos. So, it seems to me that, like with, with what Mike was saying earlier, that when when you're reading this verse three, that the alarm bells are going off in their heads, so they're knowing something covenantally is happening here, something that we're not picking up much it's, later, two thousand years later, we're not picking up on it. But it's exploding in their mind when they're hearing yeah. this. It's a specific time is what they're mm -hmm. hearing. It's not just near, but it's a very specific period of time, which is connected to all these other prophecies. Let, let mm -hmm. me ask you this, Mike. You know, I know that Kairos is used in Deuteronomy 32, and you talk about a wicked and perverse generation. What would you say to somebody that says, well, there were numerous wicked and perverse generations. If you want to take Babylon in that 586 judgment, what if somebody said, well, can Deuteronomy 32 not be talking about that? Is that not an appointed time for it? Or is is the specific perverse generation, which I know we see in Philippians 2.15, Jesus says it all over the place. Um, it, is that specifically pointing me to that? Or does it have dual, dual fulfillment to that? Or what would you say? I don't say know that? if it has dual fulfillment. If it does, um, I would actually be okay with that because the Jews would look at a lot of passages in Isaiah and, and use a dual fulfillment. They would say, okay, we can see how this was, that the second Exodus was fulfilled under Ezra and Nehemiah, but it's not the real second Exodus. It's not the real gathering because the real gathering is going to be in Messiah when the branch comes. Okay. So, so, so they right. had, they had that working in their minds as well. They understood that some of these prophecies were fulfilled in their day, but they saw the greater fulfillment type of anti-type. All right. To be fulfilled when messiah would come that's when the real second exodus generation the real gathering would come so i haven't dove real big into that all i'm looking at is how the new testament authors understand kairos and that generation because they connect the two then when they send the and when peter says the end of all things is near because the kairos had a had been there and he's living in that perverse and crooked generation you can't push it beyond 87. Right. Well, could that, and that gets us back to what we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Because the appointed time, the Kairos, was set in a covenantal context for a covenant that no longer exists. Yeah. yeah well, it, it's, the, it's the same thing, Zach. We've talked about uh, with the enemies of 1 Corinthians 15. 
you know, people will say, well, or do, does God not have enemies today? You know, well, yes, he does. But there was a context to that. And there was a specific thing they had in mind Amen. when they were talking about his enemies being placed under his feet. And in the same sense, yeah, you can say every every generation's wicked and perverse. But why are uh, Jesus and the apostles applying that to their context in their day? And it's because all of these things are tethered together and you can't deny that. Yeah, it's connected to the last days. Right. That perverse and crooked generation is connected to the last days. It's connected to the, the end being near and the Kairos. They're all connected together. And the New Testament brings them all together. And I know, Travis, you've been doing a lot of stuff on the second Exodus, right? I think in Sunday school, I've seen you. Yeah, Zach, Zach wrote me into teaching our youth boys. So that's, uh, <laughs> I, I was uh, trying to figure out, you know, what to do with them. And I thought, you know what, this this would be fun for, for all parties involved. So, yeah, we just, I've started at the beginning and I plan to just walk it through with, with however much time I have. Amen. So I'm only two lessons in though, so we haven't made it that far. You got four weeks. <laughs> well, oh, it's man. like you were saying, Mike, whenever, so like, or Zach, both of you with a dual fulfillment is that, you know, there was a time there, there was a lot of question about Antiochus Epiphanes going into the temple, turning it into a brothel and sacrificing a pig on the altar. And that how the Jews of the time believed that that was like the abomination of desolation. And they, they, they didn't know, you know what it was, but they, they had, alluded to that right and so the reason i bring that up is because we know that it wasn't because jesus told us that it wasn't exactly. and so jesus and the apostles are the ones that line this up for us exactly. and that's that's how we have to interpret it right well, also because the dead weren't raised during the time of antiochus epiphanies and the courts weren't seated and the books were opened and the and resurrection the and the judgment happened during the time exactly of antiochus epiphanies and the end of the power of the holy people being completely shattered wasn't during the time of Antiochus Epiphanes and, right. and the city and the temple were not desolated. That's right. So well, that's right. Yeah, well, it, it doesn't fulfill it. Why well, and the and the reason you know, for me this is so this is so powerful because and I I, I do want to get right into Joel, but I, I know you guys have encountered all this too is is um you know and I and I want to figure out as as someone who believes these things are all fulfilled, you know, how how do I live now? How then shall I live? That's that's obviously an a very important question, but we need to trace it back to why do we have that question and all these events. And I get, you know, one of the pushbacks I get a lot is, oh, you're just trying to throw everything into 70 AD. You're trying to throw everything into this period of time between Pentecost and what you think is Jesus appearing. And what I'll say to people is because, because many, many Christians agree that the, the, the passages we're talking about are all talking about the same thing, but they would just put that same thing at the end of the world. Right. Well, if the end of the world would only happen once and all those events would culminate in that so-called event, then those same events, if they are all talking about the same time, have to culminate somewhere at the same time and in the same place. And so it's not just, you know, people say all you've got is a, all you've got is a time statement, Joel. And that's kind of like saying <laughs> it's kind of like saying all I've got is a wedding ring to tell you I'm married. All I've got is a guitar to tell you I'm a guitar player. I mean, that that should be enough in itself. But the reason all of it agrees is because of the, it was the appointed time and that this special, unique time that, you, that Moses had looked to, that all the prophets looked to. And as we get into into Joel, and yes, I, I picked it because it would be fun because he, he shares my name. But but it's, it's a lot more than that. I want to work backwards a little bit because what you know Peter is quoting this passage in Joel at Pentecost. And what as you go on in chapter three of Acts, he gets to this amazing verse where he where he says that Samuel and all the prophets who have spoke spoke about these days. And that speaks to like, like the dual fulfillment you guys have mentioned, that even if some of these prophecies, may, they may have had a fulfillment right in their time, but I think we can still talk about them as as, as foreshadowing this, this one final day of the Lord that then Peter is saying all this, all this stuff, no matter what else the prophets were saying, no matter the particular fulfillment at their time, they're also all looking to this present time, you know, Peter his contemporaries, the same contemporaries that Jesus had, all the apostles, this this unique, unrepeatable time in history. And uh, I just, I mean, you put all that together and I don't see how, I don't see how people come to other conclusions. They do, <laughs> but, I, but I don't know how they do. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead, um, unless you guys have any other uh, comments there, I'm just going to go ahead to the Joel passage. Hammer down, man, hammer down. All right. So this is what Peter is quoting, what's often referred to as the first sermon in Acts 2, and he's quoting from Joel beginning in, in 228, and then 
uh, through Joel, beginning in chapter 3. So this is reading from Joel. It shall come to pass afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also my men servants and maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in these days, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. And of course, people listening will will recognize that even if you didn't recognize it from Joel, because Peter is just quoting that. But then going on in chapter 3, verse 1 in Joel, Before behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I'll gather all the nations. And it go on, goes on there. And I didn't realize until Mike pointed out earlier with some of his studies he shared that, that Joel 3, 1, Behold, in those days and at that time, is also in the Septuagint referring to that appointed time and so then peter's saying hey you know what what all you guys are seeing right now in front of you this is that time this is what all the prophets have spoken about and so there's just another you know great example um of that of that special and unique time and i always think about galatians 4 i think it's verse 4 where it talks about jesus being born you know, under the law at this at this certain time and then you go back to daniel that's when the kingdom would come in and um, all this stuff, just I, I think you said this, Zach. I heard I heard one of your videos recently, or it might have been um, it might have been in your message Sunday after the Arkansas conference. But you said something to the effect of the more I understand this stuff, the more my the, the Bible is shrinking, something like that. Did you say that? I say it all the time. I said what you just said about Galatians four and Daniel two in Sunday school this morning. Are you sitting in there or what? <laughs> 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 do, you, do you guys think when we're when we're talking about the appointed time uh, and obviously we're all in agreement, that was a very special, specific time period. When we talk about the last days, is there a correlation there? Like, it, are we saying that that's the last days of said time? Yes. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, and, because Peter, so go ahead, Mike. No, you go ahead. I was just saying, because what what you just quoted, you know, what what Peter says in Acts chapter two that's very early on. That's the birth of the church. That's where it's beginning, right? So when you start reading Peter's letters, it's much later on. It's getting real close to before the end. And, you know, there's people in those last days, those scoffers that are like, when, when is he coming? So when's he coming? Right. They've been talking about this for almost 40 years. Yeah. So that's that time. It's such a, it's very pivotal. Evidently from the time of Messiah all the way till his second coming, all of that time is that's that's just the melting pot. That's where it all takes place. Yeah. yeah. And now the last days is picked up in Deuteronomy 31, 29. And then in Deuteronomy 32, your latter end is referring to the last days, the latter part of the last days mm -hmm. when Israel's end would come. But the last days is picked up in Daniel 2. All right. So we're getting more knowledge as to when the last days are going to come. Daniel is really specific. Oh, the last days. That's going to come during the fourth empire, the Roman empire. That's when Messiah is going to show up in those last days at that appointed time. So he's bringing it. He's, he's just narrowing it down even more. And then when the New Testament authors get there, they're like, it's here. The Roman mm -hmm. empire is here. The Messiah is here. He says the appointed times come. It's going to take place when he comes upon the clouds and the temple is destroyed and the city is desolated. And it's just, it's beautiful when you trace all this. Now, Joel, you'd mentioned that. And then look at Joel 314. For the day oh, of the, for the day of the Lord is near. That's the great and terrible, notable day of the Lord of Joel 2 and Acts 220 that Peter says you need to be saved from. Right. Well, that would make no sense if we're talking audience relevance. Right. Adam Clark points out that this is the, the great and notable day of the Lord in Acts 2 is A.D. 70 as well. But they were to be saved. And then notice in chapter two, verse the very last verse, it says that there's going to be survivors. Why are there if this is the second coming at the, the end's world history, when the globe is burned up, the planet's burned up. I would think that there'd be no survivors, but we, we get this in Isaiah 
we get the survivor theme in Isaiah two through four, which also picks up the last days and the great notable day of the Lord or the day of the Lord. You get in Isaiah 65 and 66 at the day of the Lord. There's these survivors that go on and preach the gospel and the new creation. So clearly this is not talking. The appointed time is not talking about the end of world history. Joel, like you're saying, everyone is saying. Think um, about what a terrible eschatology it is. If Peter is using Kairos in the appointed time to say, hey, the Messiah has been raised up and seated on the throne. Now the world's ending. <laughs> yeah. I know, uh, I know Don Preston has pointed this out and other people do as well, but same idea with, you know, talking about, you know, telling people to go hide, you know, get up in the mountains or go to these different places. Like what's, the, what good is that going to do you if there's going to be some implosion of the whole planet? And, and solar yeah. System? Revelation chapter six, when we get there, we'll definitely be talking about that. Yeah. And Isaiah too. I so, was reading, I was reading a commentary before we get off Kairos right quick. I was reading a commentary this week. I just want to read you a part of it here. If I, it's okay for me to just read a small section of it. Sure. This message of the covenantal judgment and change marked the opening of Christ's ministry when he declared the time, the kairos, is fulfilled and the kingdom is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel presents Mark 115 as a striking figurative parallel. That's true. That's the already of the appointed time. Yes. That's gentry. He's taken. <laughs> he's taking like gentry. He's taking Kairos to, to get us to the same spot. Yeah, but see, he creates two eschatological not yet, because the appointed time in the Olivet discourse here. Let me get there. It's used in Luke twenty one eight, uh, also I be, I believe verses twenty two through twenty four, and then uh, in Mark's account, he also uses Kairos. Well, he's playing with two into the ages. Look at what Gentry said exactly. up here. He said, the time has come. The day has arrived. As we will see more particularly in Revelation 1-7, these nearness indicators point to the approaching end of that Jewish age and the overthrow of Jerusalem with its old covenant at Mount Sinai and the coming which is to break in pieces and consume all other kingdoms, never to be destroyed. And he quotes Daniel 2-44. This is the same guy who says at the end of the age in Matthew chapter 24, the end of world one, to, history. one to three is the end of world history. Notice in his writings, Zach, he'll talk about the end of the Jewish age, referring to AD 70, but he'll never, Give everywhere Jesus mentions it, he mentions it as the end of the age. Show me the text. Exactly. Show me the text where the Jewish age ends. And let's, let's get down to the details, but he won't answer questions. He just says this stuff. So, yeah. so just to make sure I'm tracking with what you just said, Gentry's saying Revelation 1-7 is the end of the old covenant age, but that's a different end of the age than the Son of Man coming on the clouds of Matthew 24. He asked two different yeah. questions. And he'll say the resurrection of Daniel 12 was fulfilled in AD 70, spiritually and corporately, but that's the resurrection that comes at the end of the age in Matthew 13, which he says is the end of world history. It, it, it makes no sense because at the end of the age... When the wheat and the tares are separated, that's the resurrection of Daniel 12 at that end of the age, which is the Jewish age. But he just will not let that text go to AD 70 because of the post-millennialism that's just connected to it. But it, it's so confusing when he says that. Yeah. Hmm. I'm going to have to is go that, back and watch this to even wrap my head around what you just said. I know, I know, right? I'm just sitting here just thinking, I mean, yeah, it's... Uh, how how that how that all works sometimes really confuses me when other people talk about it too, like well Gentry takes it this way and Matheson takes it this way and then you know Wilson takes it this way. I totally get it, but you know sometimes I just need to get it my way. I like it my way. <laughs> well, they're making this stuff way too hard. I mean, no wonder people are so confused. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. I mean, and that, well, the only thing I heard is what we said. But see, that's orthodox. Doesn't that mean to make straight is to confuse everybody? Sorry. <laughs> can we title this es this episode Burger King Eschatology? <laughs> so you can have it your way. <laughs> well, see, the, you know, see, see, let's right? let's let's stick on what Joel is talking about and Peter's eschatology, right? Okay. So in Joel chapter two, he links the eschatology of Joel with the eschatology of Deuteronomy thirty-two. Verse 5 and 20, when he says that they were to be saved from this perverse and crooked generation, right? Mm -hmm. So in Peter's epistles, his letters, he also uses kairos. Look at number two. 
He says that they were living in that perverse and crooked generation, Acts 2.40. And he says that the appointed time of consummation had come right. when he would what? Judge the living and that he was ready to judge the living and the dead. The end of all things is at hand. And then in verse 17, he says, the judgment or was the time, Kairos, the appointed time. It was the appointed time for the judgment. I mean, he's he's using all of the words. Go ahead, Zach. Is that a different Kairos? Um, so this is a different Kairos for Gentry or no? <laughs> Gentry won't do this study. He will not do what we're doing with Kairos. Okay, because, well, because here's the problem. If you're going to, why is the Kairos in Revelation 1-3 not the same as Daniel chapter 12 where you get, wasn't Kairos in Daniel 12 because earlier? Because you got a resurrection of the dead in Daniel 12, just like you're this is Peter, why so he won't do Kairos. it, Zach. There, because just like Joel said, there's only one prophesied appointed time in the Old Testament that is connected to one judgment, to one decreation, yeah. right? Um, one coming of vengeance to repay the Jews for the sin of blood guilt. There's only one. And in Daniel 12, 4, Septuagint, it's the appointed time of the end. There's not two ends. There's not an end of the Jewish age and the end of world history age. There's only one appointed time of the end. Peter says it was near. That's why these partial preterists will not do any kind of Greek study on Kairos as it is applied to eminence in the New Testament, because there's only one. And, and that's why they too they have to keep if, if I, I think i'm tracking with you they have to keep that they have to have confusion in the age because again going back to daniel what comes in the everlasting age well when does the everlasting age with no end end it doesn't end <laughs> and they know that so they've got to say we're still in that age but have all these contradictions and say some things are and some things aren't to to keep them from having a what i would see as a consistent view does that make sense yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, since we're in Revelation, we're, we're bringing it right into Revelation, right? So we've looked at 1 verse 3, the appointed time is near. Now, every Jew would go, oh, that's Daniel. Because remember, the Bible of the first century was the Septuagint. So whenever the New Testament quotes something in the Old Testament, 80% of the time they're quoting from the Septuagint. All right. They understood what Kairos, Kairos meant when they were you know, when it was used in the Septuagint and Daniel and Isaiah and Joel. So Kairos is used three times in Revelation. We just looked at one in the, in the first chapter, but it's used in chapter 11, verse 18, when it talks about this three and a half years when Jerusalem would be trodden down by the nations, by the Gentiles, the Romans, for three and a half years, you go down to verse 18, and he says, this would be the appointed time, Kairos, for the dead to be judged, or for the judgment of the dead. Now, Zach, you were pointing this out. Let's go back to Daniel 12. What is Gentry's problem here, and Doug Wilson's, and whoever else? I don't know what they've done with 12. Have they, have they given Well, in that? Daniel 12, right, they've made two different resurrections. Have they given that resurrection of Daniel 12 already up and said it's a first century thing? I can't keep up with them changing their mind. I know. <laughs> well, I asked Gentry a long time ago and he said, Daniel 12's resurrection has nothing to do with physical bodies. Then I challenged him at the Criswell uh, conference on the millennium. I said, hey, look, you gave this up. He then he totally changed. He says, well, there's an already and not yet to it. <laughs> what? So, so he creates two appointed times of the end. One in AD 70, and then one at the end of world history. But Daniel 12 does not teach that. There's only one appointed time of the end, and it's connected to the judgment of the city when the power of the holy people will be completely shattered, and that's when the dead are raised, of verse 2 and 3. There's not two. These guys have to read that into the text, eisegesis, to toll their creedal line. Well, and he's he's taking it from Ezekiel 37. So where's it at in Ezekiel 37 also in Daniel 12? I mean, you got the same problem. Exactly. Exactly. You also, have, you also have two resurrections that were for two different purposes because you'd have one that's the hope of Israel and the, uh, the next one would be what? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so then the third use of Kairos in Revelation, does anyone know where that is? Is it 22? Yes. 2210. Can someone read that? 
I can grab that, it here. Because that takes us back to Daniel 2. All right, I got it. So Revelation 22, 10 um, says, And he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. The appointed time is near or at hand. Now, is that not going back to Daniel? What was Daniel told about the appointed time in Daniel 12? Seal it up in verse 4. It's a long way off. So he was to seal up the the vision of the appointed time of the resurrection of of verses 2 and 3. John is given the same prophecy, and he's told not to seal up the appointed time, the prophecy of the appointed time, because it is near. But that appointed time is the resurrection of Daniel 12. Do you see the problem of inserting two different resurrections, two different ends, two different ages? Because new, the New Testament just does not allow you to do that. What do these guys do with like Daniel 12, 13, when he's talking about you, Daniel, go your way and seal up the book. You'll rise to your inheritance at the end of the days. I mean, why can they not, if they're putting those last days there, and these last days happen in the appointed time, and the resurrection happens in the appointed time, then why can't they see that the kairos and the end of that appointed time is for the Old Testament, old saints like D Daniel, who were in the grave, to be raised out of the grave? Well, why, Jordan, why is that not simple enough to do? James Jordan gets it in Daniel's comment, in his Daniel commentary. It's the first time I ever saw anybody say it. And when he said it, that's the instant that I became a full preterist because everything mm -hmm. fell into place. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was interviewing Gary DeMar and we talked about that because in his debate with Michael Brown, when, when Michael brought up the gathering of the elect of Matthew 24, 31, he thought that Gary was going to do that typical partial preterist. Well, this is a post AD 70 evangelism. We're all angels, blah, blah, blah. He says, no, this is the resurrection of the dead ones, the old Testament dead ones. Now, once Jordan gave that up, and Daniel 12, as the Old Testament dead ones are raised out of Hades or Abraham's bosom into God's presence to inherit eternal life at the parousia in AD 70. I mean, the fat lady singing, I mean, it's 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 over. It, it is over because that is the resurrection. There's not another one at the end or that at the appointed end anyway. Where do they where do they go to create a separate? Resurrection would that be First Corinthians fifteen? Would they say that's not the same resurrection as Daniel twelve? Well, you just you don't understand, Travis. I mean, Israel had an eschaton, but you know we have this other eschaton for the church, right? Sure. And so they so they all unite on First Corinthians fifteen. Um, but again, what is the end there if not the end of Daniel right. twelve and well, the Paul, resurrection of Daniel twelve? Paul tethers it to Isaiah twenty five. And the death veil uh, being swallowed up and the, the marriage supper of the Lamb and all those things, were those not tethered to Israel? <laughs> and the trumpet gathering in 1 yep. Corinthians 15 is also going back to Isaiah 27, verses 12 and 13 at the harvest. But you go back to verse 9, that's when Jerusalem has left a heap of rubble and the altars are crushed like mm -hmm. stock stone when they're forgiven of their mm -hmm. sins. So you've got all these Old Testament passages that Paul's drawing on 1 Corinthians 15, and when you go to those Old Testament passages, it's connected to the destruction of the city or the temple. Well, even something as simple as you mentioning the harvest, you know, me and Zach, we live in rural Arkansas. That that means something to people around here. But to most folks, what relevance does a harvest have to us today? I mean, that again, that's tethered back to, to the Jewish um, uh, society and Jewish language. So it, it all points one direction and there's no way around that. Amen. So. Do you guys feel like you've hammered down on Kairos or you got any more? No, I think we nailed it. Well, there was something that I'd read in uh, Chilton's Days of Vengeance that I'd never heard before. I'm sure all of you have already heard it, but that Revelation 1-3 is actually the first of seven Beatitudes in Revelation. Had you guys heard this before? I never no. had. No. Late on, or I've, I've read him, but it was so much long ago. Late yeah, on. so uh, just for the first one, it's kind of interesting if you think about the way that the Beatitudes in Matthew were written, if you listen closely, he says, blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein. And then there is a colon. 
right? So it's kind of like, and then it says, for the time is at hand, which is interesting because if you, by the way that you described it, what are you trying to show us? The Beatitudes? Yeah, I think Gentry's borrowing all over the place from Days of Vengeance and Peter Lighthart's commentary, just FYI here. Is he? Okay. okay. So I'd never heard of it until I was reading Days of Vengeance. and But I went back and started reading the old Beatitudes. Like, you know, so I'm going to just, just for fun, if it's okay with you guys, I'm going to read a couple of the Beatitudes that Jesus said on his Sermon on the Mount. Uh, so I'll go to Matthew chapter 5. And he kicks it off right out of the gate. Blessed are the poor in spirit, colon, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, colon, <laughs> for they shall be comforted, right? Blessed are the meek, colon, for they shall inherit the earth. So you hear at the beginning of it, blessed are they for this, whatever it may be, the poor in spirit, those that mourn. And then the answer, the answer to it is that they'll be comforted, that the meek, they will inherit the earth. The merciful, they will obtain mercy. So it's really cool because when you read Revelation verse one or chapter one, verse three, and you think of it in the same light, and maybe this is just me reading English, I don't know. But if you think about what that is, blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, colon, for the time is at hand, for kairos. In other words, it, I mean, it's like a, it's a stamp. It's, yeah. this is now all of the answers to these beatitudes are going to happen. Do you see what I'm saying? That if you read Jesus, Jesus is saying they shall obtain mercy. They will inherit the land. This in the will creation, happen. In the new creation. Which in is the new the, creation. Which is so what John is saying. Yeah. yeah, he's kicking it off and saying, guess what? Bam. It's yeah. here. You're going to obtain mercy. You're going to inherit the land. You're going to get all of it. It's a powerful beatitude, man. You're that's saying the, I can't say the Lord's the, Prayer anymore? You can if you would like. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Lord, that your kingdom has come. That's right. You can say it in the present tense. Yeah. Yeah. Say it in the present tense because that's what you have. Well, one, one, thing that, one thing that I love about that, Rick, and uh, is that is it you know it brings revelation but there, there's a guy uh, he's a really good teacher he's in spokane washington his name is bruce bruce gore he's a, he's a partial preterist yeah i love his stuff on youtube it's great yeah and Lee, and he's super honest too he says his objection to full preterism he says i'm just uncomfortable with it philosophically at least he's he's honest but but he uh you know he has this thing he says when he's teaching revelation he says i want to put revelation back in people's bible and by you you know connecting that back to mm -hmm. matthew 5 and then we're talking about that the trumpets always have the things i mean you can't you cannot divorce revelation from the rest of the 65 books in the scripture when you see all these connections and that was kind of a new one for me i i read days of vengeance but that was the first time i had seen it too and it's just powerful and then all of a sudden you go oh this is actually talking about all the same things this isn't just some rogue book over here that i don't know what to do with so thank you for that yeah. even in the beatitudes you i mean that's and in Matthew 5, right at the beginning of this sermon, that he talks about you're the city set on the hill. I mean, he gives you the New Jerusalem picture right off the bat, too. Yes, yeah. and he's pointing to it in the future. But so he's bringing it. This is the year of the Lord's favor. This is what he just he just did it. He went through the wilderness. He goes to Nazareth. He's sitting there. He's telling them this is the year of the Lord's favor. Mm -hmm. He goes up on the mountain. He says these things. He's pointing to this time. And John is saying the time is here. The time is now. It's at hand. The same way that John the Baptist said that the Messiah is at hand. The kingdom is at hand. Powerful stuff. Well, it's, it's, if, it's in that section no, too in the sermon when he talks about how the uh, he gives that parable about the house that was built on the sand that would wash mm -hmm. away and be judged. And he gives the parable about that was built on the rock. I mean, that's your, there's the book of Revelation. It's all in it. Yep. Well, let, let me tie that together. Um, N.T. Wright and uh -oh. a co-author, a co-author of Beals. Can you hear me? Is there something wrong? I got you. Okay, I think I think Rick's free. Rick's free. Yeah, I, can, I can hear you too, Mike. Yeah, but Rick's Zach, he points out that there's an inclusio between Matthew five and Matthew seven, and so when he closes the inclusio in chapter seven, when he's saying, "Listen to my words." Obey them, because if you do, you'll be like a wise man who builds his house, temple, on the rock. 
Mm. He is the rock, right? He's the cornerstone. He is the temple. He's the cornerstone to the new temple. So what he's saying is the followers of Jesus, you're becoming the new city of light. You're becoming the new temple. And the storm that's coming is the flood that's coming by the Romans. And mm -hmm. only my remnant will escape that wrath. So you better listen to my words and you better become my new temple built upon me. So it, it's pretty cool, actually. Did anybody uh, on that side happen to have like everybody go missing on the screen by any chance? You froze up just. Yeah. OK, so that was me. I'm sorry, guys. We're, we're still having issues with the Internet in our area. Uh, I thought okay. you were in deep. I thought you were in deep prayer and meditation. <laughs> <laughs> I was just. Yeah, the other yeah. thing, you, you know, you guys are talking about and bring, bring this all together. And this is something you know, I did for about 27 some years without realizing it is when we you can know, think about how many times we've heard this type of thing preached. So somebody and, and even even a pastor or teacher, whoever, and they might address the audience or give the context slightly. And they would say, you know, we, we realize that these people were we're probably encouraged by this message. And that's why we can be encouraged, too. I mean, you, you can make a general application for from that, but what we do when we divorce all this from its right context and the kairos, the appointed time, is we're we're hijacking something from those actual people that were finally going to get relief, and they had all these promises made to them, and we're saying, ah, doesn't really matter. But boy, I'm glad, you know, you know that I'm glad these things are going to happen to me. And it's just it's kind of doing violence to the text and violence to that to that generation of believers. It withstood all these things. Does that, does that make sense? That resonates. Yeah, yeah it, it sounds is. like you're saying, I'm not blessed if I read this book like it says. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. yeah. It's, it's a perversion of the gospel to an extent. I mean, futurism still has enough of the gospel, which people can be saved, but it's a perversion of the gospel because what you're saying is, Paul said, Our hope is not on things which can be seen, but on the things which cannot be seen. Jesus says, When the kingdom comes, and forgiveness of sin arrives, you're not going to be able to see it because it's going to be within you. Now, if we say that that is not enough and we believe that the gospel, the climax of the gospel is all this physical stuff, the globe burning, we've perverted. I'm sorry. We've perverted a really large part of the gospel. And I think that's the, the ultimate danger is not just, you know, are we given the right application here, which I think is what you're getting at. We need to get at the heart of the gospel first show Christians who they are positionally in Christ and what he's done through the cross and the parousia, then we can make all these applications, you know, I mean, if you but let's make this, these, let's make that point too, Rick. I mean, Mike, we can talk about positional stuff and a lot of people in the reform camp too. I'm as righteous as Christ or whatever. Yeah. No, you're not. If your eschatology is not the same as ours, you're not, you're, you you're don't not in the world of righteousness. Life. Apparently. Nope. You're waiting on the age of righteousness to come. Yeah. You wretch. Yeah, but the beauty of it is, is that they are. They just don't know that they right. are. Right. <laughs> right. That's okay. the grace of God in action. But it's a great point. It's the same thing. I'm, I mean, I might get off track a little bit. I blame Zach because he started it. But I mean, same thing with salvation, right? I mean, if we, if we, if we, if we have a different view, we don't really have salvation at this point. Mm -hmm. and, and Christians believe that they do, but it is a, it is a big deal. I just keep seeing this more and more. It's more. We've talked about this before. You know, but it's more than just. A proper eschatology it's a whole understanding of the, of the what i might call the fulfilled you know the complete gospel whatever you want to look at it but it's, it's a big deal and i hope people listening that maybe are hearing these things for the first time will will really consider them yeah well i think we've got the treatment on uh chapter one verse three pretty good so why don't we go ahead and move on so he just gives us this beatitude he starts hammering down on kairos this is the moment so let's read these first words of the letter, chapter four or chapter one, verse four, and I'll read all the way through eight. And guys, we can break it down however you see fit. John to the seven churches, which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. And from the seven spirits, which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, 
He cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. That is one opening statement, bro. That is incredible. What a great statement. Pretty good resume. Yes, that's yeah, very good. Yes, a very good resume. So right out of the gate, he's going to the seven churches which are in Asia. That's something that I finally learned in the past few years in regard to audience relevance, how important it is for us to know right out of the gate, this letter is going to seven churches in Asia. Yeah, I think it's Gentry in his commentary. He does a good job of showing the actual listing of the seven churches actually followed a mail route they in did. the world. So there's there's no mistaking this. You know, I talked about before how dispensationalists spiritualize these seven churches, but then they, they cast a gate reformed people for over spiritualizing revelation, but yet then they begin spiritualizing these seven churches to mean different church ages and periods. Yeah. And of course they're always living in the, in the climactic church. Period. We were in the Laodicean age, bro. Yeah. I was. I yeah. was. <laughs> no, nar no narcissism and, and twisting of scripture there. He'll spew you out of your mouth for being lukewarm, bro. Get out of the Laodicean age. That's what he told us. I'm trying my best to behave. <laughs> so, so he goes, so he sends the letters to Asia. There's, there's these seven churches. And then he immediately starts off with the church's grace be unto you in peace from him, which is, and which was, and which is to come, which when you look down later in verse eight, this is Christ speaking. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, which is, and which was, and which is to come. He's in agreement, the almighty. So this is how I see right out of the gate. He's, he's, he's in agreement. This is what John is writing to them. Now, here's a question that I have for any of you guys. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne, can you guys reference anything in the Old Testament in regard to those seven spirits before his throne? Zechariah with the seven eyes, the stone of seven eyes. All right, the stone of seven eyes. I don't remember the verse, but maybe it's in Isaiah 11. Let me get there. I, Doug Wilson points this out in his commentary when the man comes around. I think it's it's a prediction about when the Messiah comes. And I don't know if this is right or not, but I've just heard people say it. Isaiah 11, 1. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. It's Jesus. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, nice. the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. Wow. So, Shout out to Dougie Fresh on that well, one. I've always heard <laughs> Dougie Fresh. I've always heard seven is a biblical number of perfection or completion. And so when it's saying seven spirits, it's just a name for the Holy Spirit. So maybe you're right because of Isaiah 11. I don't know. Yeah, it's like that. And I've all, have you guys ever heard uh, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of mm -hmm. wisdom? Spirit of understanding, of counsel, of might, of knowledge, fear of the Lord. You guys heard that before? Yeah, I just did. Zach, 30 Zach, seconds ago. Zach pulled up. Yeah. <laughs> Good job, Zach. Alternative view <laughs> is that the seven graces of Romans 12, 6 through 8 reflect the seven spirits of God. Have you heard this? Mm -mm. One, insight, prophecy. Two, helpfulness. Um, or service or ministry. Instruction, teaching, encouragement, generosity, guidance, and compassion which also agrees with Isaiah 11, Zach. That's good. I, no further no, no further need to address the witness, Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I can speak to that. Can I go back a step one? Yeah. Because I get this question a lot. How would you guys answer this? People will say, well, if this whole deal was about the destruction of Jerusalem, then, you know, if that's what the apocalypse is about, then what are the churches that are – why is he writing this letter to seven churches spread throughout who aren't in Jerusalem? How would you guys, what would you guys say to that? Like, what does it have to do with him? What do they care? Well, the tribulation spilled over into the Roman empire. Okay. So 
it, it would have an effect on these churches. And, and as we read and we get into to the churches, you see that some of them are being persecuted and, and would be persecuted, right? By those who say that they're Jews, but are not. Because remember, there are synagogues that are planted throughout these seven churches. And that's where Paul would go first. He'd go to the Jew first and then the Gentile yeah. to preach at these synagogues in these in these countries. And they would be converted and then they would start their church, which was usually a mixture of the Jews that converted. And then those God fearers or those Gentile proselytes would become Christians. And that's but those Jews from those synagogues would radically persecute those Christians and they would try and use the Roman Empire to help them. And so that's what we see in the book of Revelation. You have the land beast and the sea beast coming together to persecute not just the Christians in Jerusalem, but it spilled over into the Roman Empire. What would you say about the idea of like, if if they were still tempted to go back to Judaism, which Hebrews is obviously about, don't go back, don't go back, don't go back. Then if they're still associating with things like those feast days and they're going to wind up in Jerusalem during the time of this apocalypse. So maybe some of that's part of it, too. I think so. That's how I, I look at uh, Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians 1 and 2 there where the tables were going to be turned. The Jews who are persecuting the Christians in Thessalonica, they would get the same trouble and persecution that they were dealing to the Christians. Well, how did that happen? Well, they would go to Jerusalem for the feast. They would travel and they would listen to the false prophets that were saying, don't leave, stay. And that wrath and that trouble came upon them when they came to the city. That's the same picture as Jeremiah, because in, in the book of Jeremiah, he's telling them, get out, get out of the city. He's telling them to go. So Jesus, same thing. So that's yeah. a good point. Well, yeah. the thing that I would say, Zach, in regard to that outside of the Bible, OK, something that is really important when people say, why would people outside of Jerusalem care if this is just about covenant age? All right. Well, if you understand the Roman Empire and how large this empire really was. I mean, it was, it was massive, right? Okay. Well, isn't it interesting that the general that first goes to Jerusalem, Vespasian, ends up becoming the emperor of the total empire? And where was he? He was there. General Pompey came in. We got Vespasian. Then there's unrest. And so Vespasian goes back to Rome, and he becomes the emperor of the Roman Empire. And so who finishes the job? It's his son, Titus, who goes to Jerusalem, right? So we know this historically, but do you know what Titus becomes eventually? He becomes the emperor of Rome. So to think that these two very, very critical men in Roman Empire and Roman history focus their time in Jerusalem. Think about the rest of the world and all of the other things going on in the world. Why did these men become the most powerful men in the Roman Empire? To me, it's it's pointing historically. It's pointing out that it did matter what was happening in Jerusalem. All right, let's really and Nero's persecution of the Christians mm -hmm. went throughout the Roman Empire. That's he right. Blamed, he blamed the Christians for the fires that he set. Mm -hmm. Well, and I won't jump the gun too much, but in Revelation 18, the Babylonian harlots deceiving the nations. So she's got some sway over how, whatever we're going to do with those nations, but. She's got some sway that's going on there wider than just Jerusalem. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I'm sure it's very similar to the way that we uh, that we look at it even today. Those that have power and influence in the financial sectors within, uh, you know, the global empire, even now, the way that people think, I would say that that would be true always and always has been. And I, you know, I hope, sorry if that didn't sound racist. I didn't mean for it to be. I just meant that and in they, most cases, uh, I'm sorry. And they deceived the nations, Jesus said, because you travel land and sea and you you make converts twice the sons of hell as, as you are. Right. I, they would travel throughout the Roman Empire in, in these churches and say, if you don't go back to Israel and if you're a Gentile and you're not circumcised and you don't live in Israel, there's no resurrection for you. There's no mm -hmm. hope. Yeah, that's but wild. Paul would say, no, we're in Christ and we have a circumcision. And if you're not in Christ, then there's no hope. He spins it right around. Right. So let's uh, unless you guys want to hit the first you know, from four to six, I want to touch on it before we finish this this hour up. 
verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. Ah, you're going to give us five minutes. You're going to, oh, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, no, I don't want you to go through it, but what I, what I, this is really what we're leading into for the yeah. next episode is that we're going to tackle that. I mean, and I want to get into dominion as well, which is the verse prior to it, but that's where we're heading. What What is he saying here? What What is John saying to the churches in that verse right out of the gate? Rick, Rick, let me just back up a sec, because I do want to just hit six real quick. And this is something that a lot of people will know they're listening, but I think it's just important to point out. And in my experience, maybe it doesn't get talked about it as much as it could have. And that's verse six, um, you know, talking about him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood, made us a kingdom, priests to God and Father, to him be glory, dominion forever and ever. And we've already talked about the temple. But just, you know, I hope this can encourage um, other believers maybe that, that don't have an understanding of this, that, that we have, you know, the same kind of access, you know, to God through Christ that the, that the high priest did. And we can go directly into his, into his throne room. Hebrew talks about that going with confidence to receive you know, mercy from God. And just, that's such a glorious thing. And you don't, I'm not against people being pastors and I, you know, I have been one and teaching different things, but we all have equal access uh, to the father in a way that people did not before, the Kairos before this special time. And I just, hopefully that encourages some people. Amen. Yeah. That's awesome. I want to throw in there too. And when I read dominion there, that, that whole end of six, my mind goes straight back to Daniel chapter seven. When, mm -hmm. when the saints possess the kingdom and it's him, even though they were persecuted there for a little bit, they wind up possessing it. And I mean, everything in Daniel seven is pointing you right there in that dominion idea. So, all right. That's a good place to start because where is the Old Testament? He's coming. Up, the Son of Man is coming upon the clouds. So this is a, a conflation of two Old Testament passages. What is Revelation 1, 7 fulfilling in the Old Testament? You've already hit one of them. Yeah, Daniel 7 is a 13, 14. 13. Yeah. Now, what does the old Greek Septuagint say of Christ coming upon the clouds there? Zach, it I think says as he comes as the ancient of days. He comes as or like the ancient of days. Now look, now you tell me if John is using the old Greek Septuagint. Now go look at verse 17 of chapter one. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though I were dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, for I am the first and the last. I died, behold, and I am forevermore. Oh, I wrong one. Verse 14. The hairs of his head were white, right? Like white wool, like yes. snow. His eyes of fire. Where are we getting in his legs of um, bronze? Daniel and, seven, ten, and eleven. That's right. He's describing Christ as or like the Ancient of Days, and he's the Son of Man coming upon the clouds. Right. And how, is he was, how, how is he going to come at, in the glory of the Father? So this is not the ascension. <laughs> This is Christ coming, his <laughs> second coming, as the ancient or like the ancient of days in judgment when the books would be open in fulfillment of Daniel 7. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, know, you know, Mike, the way you talk about this stuff, it's all, almost like the Bible comes together as a whole and makes sense. Like it's some kind of harmony <laughs> or something that interprets itself crazy. It's, it's, it is. Wow, yeah. It's well, that I think this is a good place to stop, guys, because the uh, the only thing that I can think about with Dominion was that what what God said to the man in Genesis, be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth, to have dominion over those things. It makes me think of Chilton's other book, Paradise Restored, and Dominion. But anybody got any closing thoughts for this week's episode? I don't think so. I, I think it was uh, very enjoyable. I, I certainly learned a lot the last hour. So thank you guys for that. <laughs> Just keep and praying. if you guys didn't learn the list from Zach, you can always hear me repeat it right after he says it as <laughs> if it was brand new. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep praying. I was so I was so focused on my notes that I wasn't hearing, and then I was like, "Hey, I got something fresh for you." Zach, <laughs> like, <laughs> Rick was like, "Doug Wilson? Nope. Zach Davis? Nope. Rick Wilson, baby." <laughs> hey, Travis does that to me all the time. I'll tell Travis something, 
and he won't hear nothing I say. And then <laughs> he'll hear Jeff Durbin say it three weeks later, and he'll call me, man, did you hear what Jeff Durbin says? I, say, yeah, I told you that four months ago, you dummy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was literally like, oh boy, I've got to be something fair, to Zach, that hasn't that. happened in like four years, though. <laughs> yeah, because you oh, ain't listened to Jeff Durbin in four years. <laughs> not, not one time. Awesome. Man. Well, thanks, guys. I appreciate it. And we'll get back to you guys on this one next week. Yeah. What we'll unpack maybe Revelation 1 7 a little bit more, actually, a lot more. And maybe we'll kind of dig into the Old Testament text and look at the context of Daniel 7 and prove definitively that it's not the ascension. We'll destroy Sam Frost's position, Beal's position. And then we'll kind of maybe go to Zechariah 12 as well and kind of unpack that a little bit. And so this is an exciting su- study, man. I'm I'm pumped. Rick, yeah, remind, make now, notes I'm somewhere to hit Isaiah 6. First. Okay. Rick, you, uh, Isaiah 6? Okay, I'll, yeah, be, I'll throw that, that in there. So I can Because that gets quoted all over the New Testament. And I think the idea of Christ being seated on the throne and who Isaiah saw and what he saw may connect us back to Daniel 7. Yeah. And guys, listen, if you're listening to this, whether you're on the boroughs and, uh, in, you know, it's later or if you guys are on their Patreon page and you're listening to this, tell other people about their Patreon pages. Would you? Because these men are putting a lot of effort into this. This is these this is, these are great studies. They really are. And it's people taking time out of their day to get this done. So go check out Mike Sullivan's Patreon, Zach's Patreon, Travis. Joel, have you got one now? Um, I think so. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll get those in the links. I'll be sure on the on the you know guys. If you're listening to the podcast, go into my sh- in, to show notes, and I will have links to each one. But especially send it to Travis more than anybody else. <laughs> <He's> gonna- <laughs> All right, that's in the chat. <laughs> my hero, Rick. <laughs> no, but all guys, really, be please, please go and help support these men, these ministers that are doing this. Uh, it's it's a it's a wonderful thing. Amen, guys. Well, it was a pleasure studying with you, and we will see you next week. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Trying to get raptured, anybody? Oh, no. (laughs) Oh, man.